One thing about YouTube is it looks like we always succeed. You never see our mistakes unless they're funny and we put them in a blooper reel or something. But uh, yeah, I've had several failures lately and I thought I'd show you what those are so you can save yourself the trouble or I don't know, maybe you can figure out a better way to do things and uh, tell me how to do it. Okay, let's uh, start with those. The first one is I was trying to build an earphone that didn't require an earphone and my thought was to take a piece of, of this circuit board and it's double-sided circuit board and I've got wire soldered to both sides and those wires are attached to the to the uh, earphone of the crystal radio. Now how is that going to make an earphone? Well obviously it's not going to make an earphone, it's going to make a mouth phone because I have, uh, what do you call them? Uh, not fillings, uh, crowns on the, uh, on the top and bottom teeth. Now you couldn't use the ones that are side by side because they're already shorted out, but the ones on the top and bottom are not. So I thought that I would uh, bite down on this and I would have a circuit between my upper and lower crown and I would be able to at least hear something because I use this particular radio and if you've seen my other videos about it, I can light an LED with it. So it'll produce, uh, I've gotten three volts out of it, uh, but at least 1.8 volts pretty easily. And for any of you who've chewed on aluminum foil and had that reaction with your, uh, you know, any fillings or crowns or whatever, you'll know that it doesn't take anywhere near 1.8 volts to uh, trigger a reaction. So the result was absolutely nothing. I could pick it up on my oscilloscope. I could uh, hear it through the earphone, of course. But as far as anything, no, all I got was a nasty, uh, kind of a dirty copper taste. And I wouldn't recommend doing that because, well, copper is actually toxic. So this was not a good idea. And yeah, the soldered end, I, I was biting on this far end. And I tried insulating the edges so that it wouldn't touch the edge of my mouth and, you know, all these things. But no, it was a total flop. I mean, I got absolutely zilch. Okay, what's the next thing? Well, yeah, <laughs> uh, let me zoom in here a lot. There we go. I had heard that uh, if you take zinc and you flame it, oxidize it badly, it will make a good detector. So I thought, oh, that would be nice because zinc is relatively cheap. You can buy that. Uh, just run it through an alcohol flame like I did and turn it into a melted mess and the result was nothing. Uh, well, not quite nothing. It is barely discernible as a detector. So I have seen videos on this where people used an active detector, a bias detector. They use voltage to bias. But just as a crystal radio detector, no. No, it's uh, worse than almost everything else. Okay. Finally, the last thing, I am not going to discuss how I did this because I almost got myself, uh, I almost uh, ended up uh, choking on a flaming cloud of toxic gas. Yeah, so when you think you know what you're doing and you forget that one last little detail and it almost gets you. Well, yeah, I was trying to make Galena again. Uh, I thought I had a foolproof way of doing it, a poor man's way of doing it. However, I took into account the melting point of the lead. I took into account the melting point of the sulfur. All that was good. What I didn't, oh, and the uh, flame temp, oh, the flame ignition point, ignition point of sulfur, which is rather low, by the way. And that's where it almost got me. But the thing I did not account for is the boiling point of sulfur. Sulfur starts to boil long before the reaction happens. And yeah, uh, I almost released a cloud of, of sulfur gas that would have been above ignition temperature when it hit oxygen. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, you know, as a bonus, I'm looking across my table here and I'm also seeing something else that didn't work out. This is number four. Um, I have been trying to remake a rocket radio. And for those of you who don't know, uh, way back when I was a kid in like the 50s and 60s, there were these little radios and they made them in different shapes. They made them like eggs. They made them like spheres. 
Uh, they made them look like little rockets and whatever, and they all had a little antenna that would come out of the top, and you would move the antenna up and down to tune it, and inside was a coil of wire, usually Litz wire, and then an earphone, a, uh, what else was in there? Earphone resistor, and um, I think they had a capacitor in there too. So, yeah, I'd have to look at my circuit diagram. But anyway, I had been struggling with this, and because all I could get was one station with it. And you know, when I thought back about it, uh, when I was a kid, that one would only get one station also. So maybe I'll go ahead with a one station version and do that. Um, but I don't know, to me, a, a crystal radio that gets one station, I, I can do that without a coil. I can do that with a diode and an antenna. So uh, I'm still struggling. I'd like to get at least two stations with this. As you can see, it's a, an old Bic pen, which is something very easy to come by. Some Litz wire. Uh, I've tried two different types of coils. I've tried plain wire and then Litz wire and then just a, a slug of a ferrite and just tune it back and forth in there and then I, of course I was measuring the inductance to see when I would uh, match the, uh, the AM band. But again, one, one station, I don't know, just not good enough. I'll keep pursuing this one. Okay, that was it. Just kind of an update on what goes on behind the scenes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we don't always get everything right the first time. Okay, hope you found that useful and interesting in your YouTube viewing and crystal radio experimentation.